We're up in LA. Bye, Sarah. Thank you. I don't know. It's just a sticker. Here we go. Give us a sign. Okay. Give me a sign. Hit me, baby, one more time. Don't be jelly. I'm just a little jelly. I don't think you're ready for this jelly. I don't think I'm ready for the jelly. You want to do this? Okay. Hi everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Anna, I'm Anna Janine Herman, and this is Justin Herman. <laughs> and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking to you this morning about hacking in pop culture, specifically the leak gods of geek mythology, hacking in popular culture. So in mass media journalism, hackers have been portrayed as these sort of faceless boogeymen. Um, they're anonymous in more than one sense of the word, becoming sort of their own very convenient plot device of vigilante criminal or a scapegoat or a sort of modern day folk devil with a very well known and stereotypical social profile. <laughs> we all know this guy, the hacker. They are male, they are white. They are immature and lacking in social graces or soft skills, resulting in isolation. Many are overweight, live in their parents' cave-like basements, and are motivated by selfish goals with a hunger for power or chaos. And yet, um, entertainment media finds hackers fascinating. Screenwriters love introducing a hacker character, and why? Because a hacker can create conflict or save the day in one fell swoop in a forceful, compelling, and believable way that audiences accept with the same sort of mysterious and limitless power that they would a witch or a wizard or a dragon, <clears throat> except they're real. At least they're real in the audience's perception. So a mysterious and seemingly limitless amount of power. I, I want you to think for a minute about the, the implications of that, and we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But for a little bit, we're going to take a closer look at some of the good, the bad, and the ugly in film. Okay, so I said a closer look. So we're going to enhance, <laughs> enhance, enhance. Oh, forget it. And so we're pleased to bring you the leaked hacker profiles, confidential. First one, um, one of my favorites, and very probably many of your guys' starts, was uh, David Lightman uh, from War Games in 1983. You guys have all seen the movie, I'm correct? This is what I buy. I grew up on wanting to be like so much more, being so fucking cool to change your fucking uh, school grades on your computer and shit. But David Lightman is a high school student who connects with his few of his classmates, but he does connect with attendees, a, a few college attendees, and also a girl in his class. He finds himself in trouble after looking for an unrelated game, looking for unreleased games by war dialing and connecting to the War Operations Plan Response Whopper computer, and almost starts World War III with the Soviet Union. Who of you guys know about uh, Real Genius, the show Real Genius? If you get a chance, check it out. It's really great. 1985. It's got tons of montages from the 80s. It's really sweet. But this one, Laszlo Hollyfield is a character from there. He's a long-term student who's a recluse in school of geniuses. He's smart, but he holds little social skills. There's probably no few of us that might fit in that category. Uh, he leverages statistics and preset content rules to win a vast majority of major prizes in a snack food contest. Uh, this guy lives in a closet that has an elevator that goes to the basement in a school of geniuses. And uh, this is Laszlo Hollyfield. Well, to be fair, it's a secret layer that you access through a closet. Oh, yes, okay. yes. It's not just a closet. <laughs> Martin Marty Bishop, also known as Bryce from Sneakers, 
is another one of the characters that we thought uh, really sat out and exemplified uh, the hacker stereotypes. Um, but this guy is more of an SC style. Uh, he's the owner of a Tiger Team security company with a team of specialized employees. His main focus appears to be in management and social engineering, like I said, and he has a previous long-term relationship and several friends, which, you know, make him kind of well-balanced uh, that he connects with. He gets in trouble with uh, a few unscrupulous people and, uh, you know, maybe a few nation states and um, finally was able to come out ahead. Dennis Nedry. You guys know this guy, right? Jurassic, uh, 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 uh. He's a computer programmer at Jurassic Park, and due to financial problems and low salary, sounds like a few people maybe not getting most treated in their organization, he accepted an offer from a competing company to smuggle dinosaur DNA from his employer. He creates a backdoor program that disables the park security so he can escape without notice, and of course he gets eaten by the Lophosaurus. Zero Cool from Hackers. I know this is uh, the staple of a lot of other people. That's how they got their start. Um, you know, he's a computer whiz the age of, in the age of personal computers just getting started. And after getting caught at the age of 11, he's court ordered to have no contact with the computers or touch tone phones. Um, and as his 18th birthday, he gets an opportunity once again to jump in his computers and uh, immediately begins hacking, only to find other people are doing the exact same thing. And he jumps himself into the world of hacking. Uh, in New York City. Yeah. Hack the planet. Hack, Hack the, the planet. planet. Hack the Gibson. Trust your techno lust. Um, all of those things. Another one that uh, kind of a staple that I kind of grew up with, but may not everyone may not think of him as a hacker, is of course Michael Bolton. <laughs> wait, wait, Michael Bolton. Michael Bolton. I mean, is that his actual name? That's his actual name. Just like the Ascon. Singer. Is he a Michael <laughs> no Bolton fan? Watch him after you. Lucky yeah. <laughs> exactly. If you guys get a chance, uh, Funny or Die did a, um, a skit with the real Michael Bolton in several of the scenes in Office Space. It's very fucking good. You should take a look at that. Um, so he's a program with Initech working on a, the year 2000 date bug and accounting software. He and a few other programmers decide um, to fraud the company by rounding transactions and stealing differences, um, only to regret decision as he might be going to the pound you in the ass prison. Um, yeah, so uh, the next one is Neo from Matrix, again from the 1990s, uh, 1999. Thomas Anderson, also known as Neo, is a nighttime hacker who has always felt the world just wasn't right. And after meeting a few unusual characters, he finds out the, the world, as he know, is not all that seems to be in his, and accepting that might mean radical shift of perception. So Neo from The Matrix. Uh, again, this is kind of before he kind of learns everything um, that his environment exists. Stanley Jobson from Swordfish. You guys remember this movie, right? when he gets compelled to uh, uh, hack and jump back in. Well, Stanley's out on parole after hacking the IBM Carnivore program and is banned from using computers. After being held at gunpoint, Stanley is uh, thrusted back into hacking, being forced to support terrorism plots by creating a worm or uh, possibly lose his daughter. I don't want to... I don't want to get too much off track here, but I'm not sure if the gunpoint was the most memorable part of that scene <laughs> for me personally. But... I so we move on. Halle, Halle Berry's uh, acting has never been uh, disputed on that. So, <laughs> Elliot Alderson uh, from Mr. Robot. Uh, he's a cybersecurity engineer and hacker who suffers from social anxiety disorder, clinical depression, spends his time hacking in private hacking the private lives of the people around him, and uh, he meets an anarchist who convinces him the best thing would be to take down the largest corporation <laughs> in the world. Now. Mr. Robot has been praised uh, kind of over and over again as being more authentic in real life in his portrayal of its um, the exploits. But we kind of included him because he does fit some of the closer stereotypes, um, both in his uh, wearing of the hoodies and uh, the masked persona um, that uh, him and his crew get kind of um, adopt. Elizabeth Salander with the girl with dragon tattoo. Uh, she is a black hat hacker with unique skills and great demand from corporations. She gets hired to find information. She uses a unique talents to assist an underground political journalist by anonymously leaving information about political figures on the reporter's machine. 
Okay, so wait a minute. Those profiles, they don't fit the hacker stereotype at all. No. I mean, that's what that's what the bar graph was supposed to be for. All the bar graphs were supposed to show really low marks, that they all had poor physique, and and that they weren't mature, and they had bad social skills, and they were all wicked. So why why don't the re why don't the research results show that? Well, that's what we're going to cover. Okay, so it's definitely true that some of those hackers in film fit into the stereotype. But when we started this research, I was really expecting that they were going to adhere to it a little bit more. I thought that that's where the stereotype came from. So if it didn't come from film, well, where did it come from? <laughs> it, it's a stereotype that likely grew out of a mishmash of under, misunderstood nerd culture from somewhat cloistered academia. And the scientists and engineers who were some of the first to use computer technology wisely and also to the hardcore gamers uh, bent on beating the latest uh, Conquester boss. Okay, but one thing is for sure that Hollywood is not the source of the perpetuation of this myth or this stereotype, though it's certainly guilty of creating some, shall we, shall we say, amped up visualizations that do not accurately portray exploits in a more realistic sense. Um, they're a little bit more flashy than real exploits, to say the least. We see those in the hack the conclusion of the Hackers movie, Hugh Jackman's Cubes and Swordfish, and countless other films and shows. Historically, realistic exploits aren't exciting to the average Joe viewer because they simply don't understand what's happening and what's uh, and why what reasons. Hollywood has tended us to create and amped up visualizations for the perfect of dramatic effect. No more different than uh, police car chases uh, in uh, famous heist, heist movies. Okay, but that's true across a variety of different industries, as you just mentioned with the heists. I mean, how many times have we seen a bank robbery in a film when, in reality, the amount of times that a bank has been robbed with a dramatic shootout are something you could count on one hand in the history of our country? Um, what's of concern is this overarching, across-the-board characterization of hackers as this all-powerful, unbeatable, techno-wizard with seemingly limitless amounts of power. Have you ever heard that old saying that locks only keep honest people out? Okay, so guess what? Your average Joe user, that's what they think about your security protocols because they think they're up against this guy. And particularly considering that the majority of Americans that are living today reached adulthood without ever having any contact with anything like what we consider to be a modern personal computer. I mean, maybe they used a graphing calculator or a slide rule or an ATM, but nothing like the laptop that I'm using right now or my smartphone. I mean, remember, we went to the moon with a computer that had a less sophisticated system than the smartphone that is in your pocket right now. And the average user doesn't have much more understanding of the inner workings of how that technology works or how to control it than they do a witch or a wizard or a dragon. So what does that mean? As a blue team information security professionals, we must experience a tremendous amount of frustration from users not following protocol, particularly because their experience with hacking is limited to what they see in their screens is that, that we basically feed them, and as digested by the press and the Hollywood. The press tells them that hackers are responsible for all kinds of crime, even though it's not necessarily an accurate labeling. Uh, Sarah Palin's email getting hacked. Okay, this guy did not get into Sarah Palin's email because of his amazing technological prowess. Um, you know, not to overstate my intelligence, but I could do the kind of research that this guy did, and I'm not an information technology security professional. He got in by using Wikipedia to look up the answers to her security questions. So I'm not saying that that's not still dishonest, but it's nothing like an all-powerful technological wizard with limitless power who can hack you no matter what you do that they saw on TV. An average Joe user could thwart an attack like this by simply choosing a more difficult to obtain intel that they do not release on their security questions or generate fictitious information that they put for their security uh, questions. Why does the press do it? 
Well, they partially do it to create clickbait hysteria for the e equivalent of selling newspapers, looking for the next link and reading the, the refreshes on the screen, but probably, at least partially, because the same legitimate lack of understanding that plagues their readers. They need to dumb it down to the fifth grade reading level. The hacking stereotype, the techno wizard, is just more than an irritating, campy, inaccurate, and it creates a culture which undermines the authority of the blue team community, making it more easily for public to fall prey to security threats. After all, if the evil hacksaws can compromise your computer after 30 seconds of pounding on a keyboard, no matter what you do, what is the point of following security protocol? And these average Joe users who have bought into this myth that they are powerless against hackers, they are not just the corporate environment users who make our blue teamers day to day uh, cleanup duties a busy work living hell. They're your lawmakers. And they are busy compromising national security and making overly vague laws without a significant understanding of real life hacking. In an age where it's so much more, in an age where we're so much more under threat, because it's not just data anymore, it's our personal information, our financial assets, our cars, our energy distributions, our critical infrastructure, and our state secrets. Different hackers and nation states have never been more dangerous, or the information more valuable, or more powerful as an industry. So, what's the point? The point is. The next time you grumble about hacker stereotypes, I want you to think about this talk. And I want you to remember that I know that this one is insulting. It hurts your feelings. It hurts your ego. But this one, this one is much, much more damaging in terms of how it is shaping the world that we live in and the legal climate which will prosecute cyber crimes in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So, I mean, isn't part of the problem, though, that you just start using yourselves? I mean, like, every single hack, I think, is unique. I mean, it's basically, you will say that, yeah, you know, we have this huge, you know, sock, we do all this kind of stuff, and all passwords are all in place, and that's why they had to do it early. So it's against the system. That's that's how you know. Don't we kind of perpetuate the fear? I don't know if everybody can hear Charles. James, I don't know if everybody can hear James. I knew it was a British king. I don't know if everybody can hear James, but the, the question that James just asked was, isn't the InfoSec community part of the problem? Because when we see a major hack happen, a lot of the things that we see happen over and over again in the news is that <clears throat> big companies were compromised using like basic stuff that we all know. So a company got hacked and what happened was maybe that they had a bunch of default passwords and oops, hackers got in. Honestly, um, I think that it lies down to a, 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 a disconnect between our um, blue team or just our IT departments and the IT, um, the IT security side. Um, you know, we have, we come here to conferences, but there are you know hundreds of thousands of other professionals that are not here. They're not continuing to try to learn about best practices and how to improve and how to make small measurable changes. The last training that they were kind of involved in was when they went from Novell to Active Directory in 2000. Um, they're, they're not following, uh, you know, removing different ciphers and, and cleaning up passwords and checking for common hashes. You are so mean. <laughs> So I think the short answer is yes. I mean, absolutely. The community can definitely improve and be smarter and be better and be more diligent. But as long as your average Joe user believes that no matter what they do, they're going to get hacked. As long as they have this, this belief in their own paralysis, it's not that they aren't scared of threats. It's not that they aren't capable of figuring out like, hey, maybe I should use answers to security questions that aren't available widely on Wikipedia. I mean, it's not that they can't figure that out. It's that they're so paralyzed by their own fear of hackers that they can't, they can't take that step. It's not something that they feel like they can even protect against. So if you escalate that to, or you ch change that to a, uh, um, a home invasion or something of that nature, they may put minor protections in place, but 
do they every time make sure that they put their car in the drive and in, in locks their, only keep honest people out in their um in their garage so people don't when they're driving by aren't aware that they're home or not home so does that answer your question james thank you yes He just made the comment that the many of the techniques that we're learning out in these hallways at this conference will only keep honest people out. And um, the true black hat hackers have access to technology and strategies that are ab above our capability of defending against. I think that's what you said. I mean, I think our defense uh, ability does directly depend upon the, the, the um, capabilities of the blue team side. Uh, and yeah, there are we, we are in a global world, so you can face people with extreme talents on the far end of the spectrum. But for the most case, we are not, uh, the people in this room are not techno wizards. We just have diligence and are willing to look for flaws and systems. But for the most part, the evil hacksaws in cyberspace are not techno wizards either, even though that's totally what I saw in the movie Swordfish. Right. And I, I think that's the point I'm trying to make. They're not dogs. Correct. They are just really... Of a yes, they're gods in the mythology, but only in the mythology. It's a legend. Yes. Well, I think the other problem on the other side of the spectrum is that there are large companies that perpetuate this FUD as a marketing technique to get in, and then that's regurgitated on the other end of the call. With hey, I talked to these security guys. I talked to this company, and you know the. the the threat is so overblown, it's, you know, it, it perpetuates that. Threat. So his comment was that many large corporations who are trying to sell snake oil solutions uh, prey upon this public belief in this stereotype for the purpose of making money. And you're absolutely right. They do it for the same reason that, that the press does it. The press is trying to sell newspapers, and though, yeah, their job is kind of to inform us, this day and age, we demand that they entertain us as well. And one of the things that we find most entertaining is being frightened, um, even when, you know, some of that fright is not correctly directed or is not based on totally factual information. Or properly attributed. Or properly attributed. Um, you know, that's exactly what that's exactly the sort of thing you're looking at there. So that's a very astute parallel. Yes, you're absolutely right. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. The other thing that was interesting is the comparison between the, the leading actor of Hacker, or actress, and the, the secondary character. So true. He was just talking about a comparison between um, lead actors, lead characters, protagonists or antagonists, uh, villains or heroes, versus their either the team around them or the people they're hacking against. I think a really good example of that is the movie Sneakers. If, if this had been a longer talk, we definitely would have profiled the entire team. Uh, such a dynamic cast of characters, really, really interesting characterizations to look at there. Um, uh, the movie Hackers actually would have been a really good one to do multiple character profiles profiles as well. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot of really interesting culture there. In the movie Sneakers, um, Martin, Bryce, Mar Marty Bishop's team uh, wouldn't have scored as high on the bar graph matrix as he would have. In terms of beating a hacker stereotype, Marty Bishop does very, very well versus, I'm struggling here, Dan Aykroyd's character. I don't recall the character name. Mother. But I mean, he he discusses how his wife left him because he was playing too much computer hacker stuff. Um, there's also River Phoenix's character, whose social skills are so lousy. As cute as he is, his social skills are so lousy that when he has the opportunity to make a demand, everybody else is making outrageous demands. He demands a cute girl's phone number because apparently this is the only opportunity he's going to have to get one. That's that's sad. She was pretty hot. I mean, she's definitely cute. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you so much for your indulgence. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys.